Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Wednesday video. This time you have a double treat. You've seen both of these wonderful gentlemen on the channel before, but now they're teaming up. So I am officially outnumbered. Um, we have to uh, my that way, my my right theoretically, your left, I think, on screen is uh, the wonderful Trent Hone, author of a number of books, including Learning War, which. Uh, you, if you haven't read it already, why not? I mean, the U.S. Navy War College is learning it, so <laughs> you should Ooh. too. Um, and uh, below me, that way, yes, I, I hate camera perspective. <laughs> we have uh, also the wonderful John Parshall, who is known for uh, various things, including massive contributions to the Combined Fleet website. Um, I don't know where he got the time to do that, but he apparently did. <laughs> Plus, of course, uh, Shattered Sword which is pretty much the best uh, book about the Battle of Midway that you could hope to read, uh, and a number of other works as well. But uh, today we're not actually going to be talking about, well, a little bit about the, uh, the elements of learning war, uh, maybe very tangentially touching on Midway, but not much, because today we're going to talk about another book <laughs> that they both have an involvement in, Fighting in the Dark. More on that later. Night fighting is... Uh, Rather controversial subject sometimes, but it was a very important aspect of World War II. And we're going to focus in specifically on night fighting in the Pacific in 1942, because if we focused on night fighting in World War II, it would be like, welcome to part 12 of our 24-part series. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, you'll, you'll just have to have some of our co-authors on. That's yes. right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. I mean, I've I've read uh, my copy, which is just over there, uh, through cover to cover about three times, and I'm still having to go back and go. Now I want to chase up this thing, right? Yeah, I think I think I um I read I read about half of it on the plane back from um the WNHA conference in February, and I got back and I was. And it took me another month or so to finish it because I was just completely diverted down a rabbit hole of chasing one of the references. Right. Yeah, I, I, I will just say that that was a it was a great project. We had a great team, um, two great editors. Uh, you know, many times you hear horror stories from authors about, oh, I got involved in this group project and just you know turned into a death march. Um, this honestly has been one of the most enjoyable projects, group projects I think I've ever done. Just a great team. No drama. Everybody got their stuff done on time. It, it was just golden from end to end. Trent, how do you feel about that, pretty much? Yeah, yeah, I agree with everything you said. I mean, the, the team was so good in terms of not, you know, not just uh, the scholarship, the writing that they, that they brought to the table, but in terms of their commitment to the schedule and, and the timelines. I was really impressed with that because you're right. You hear these horror stories uh, and, you know, from an editor perspective, you're always thinking, well, you'll have at least one sort of delinquent party in the bunch. Uh, right. we, we didn't have any of that. Uh, no one was late. Everyone was on time. Everyone was attentive uh, and very collaborative, too. We had a number of sessions, uh, Zoom calls like this, where we brought everyone together. Uh, we talked about, you know, how's it going? What kinds of things are you, you know, what state is your chapter in? And then we just shoot the breeze about yeah, night combat really nice group. yeah uh, and and some ideas came out of those conversations that i think made the chapters better so this this uh, yep. ability to come together talk about the project uh and talk about our work i'm gonna flash uh, the mm -hmm. cover here just so people know what we're talking about <laughs> yeah really really collaborative uh yeah. wonderful experience yeah. and and we should or at least i i, I you know want to mention that you know one of the participants one of the authors uh was um Admiral James Goldrick, and yeah. it was really great to have him involved. He did a wonderful job sharing his knowledge and experience, uh, you know, because he had been, you know, on the bridges of Navy ships at night and and knew uh, what some of it looked like, you know, and how challenging some of those experiences in terms of like estimating distances or trying to identify uh, other ships in the darkness could be. Uh, and he injected that into not just his chapter, but uh, our conversations. And I, I know, you know, there's there's a there's a passage in the introduction that you know draws straight out of an email that he sent. So uh, he really made the work better. Yeah. Sadly, uh, Admiral Goldrick just passed uh, not too long ago from from cancer. So we uh, we mourn the loss of of our team member, but uh, we're. 
we're honored that, you know, this book is actually the last uh, published contribution that he made to the field. So mm. anyway, what that's worth. Yeah. So you've yeah. got us, you've got us, the, yeah. the two, <laughs> the two bald historians from Carleton <laughs> College in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, we didn't overlap at the time, but yeah, Trent and I wrote the, uh, the American and the Japanese chapter respectively for this book. And so mm -hmm. that's what we're, we're bringing yeah. today. Hey, yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Focusing on, on 1942. So, yeah. um, but I guess in the run up to that, I suppose the first question is of course, night fighting and the, the two sides we're looking at the Japanese and the U S how does the Japanese Navy develop its night fighting doctrine pre-war because obviously night fighting was a relatively new thing for steam battleships in world war one uh with the disparity between the high seas fleet and the grand, uh, grand fleet's training regimens so how does the japanese navy sort of take that experience and go this is what we we want to do with it yeah i mean the the genesis for uh the ijn really pressing into night combat uh, as i say in the book is uh, a feeling of intense insecurity and weakness because of uh the the naval treaties that were put in place in the 1920s they know that their main battle fleet is going to be outnumbered by either the british or the americans most importantly and so having been locked into a position where they're going to be fighting that American battle line at a ratio of five to three, um, the, the doctrine of the day said that if you're up against an enemy fleet at that ratio, you're at a disastrous disadvantage because the, the ability of one gun line to concentrate all of its fire on a single target, if you're familiar with the Lanchester equations, Basically, it's it's the n squared law, you know. So the 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 combat power of these two formations varies as the square of their number. And so, if you've got ten American battleships up against six Japanese battleships, the end result of that engagement should be that the the Japanese are annihilated for the cost of one or two uh, American warships. And so. The Japanese can do the math and they realize that if we get into a straight up combat with the American battle line, we're going to be destroyed. So how do we whittle down those odds somewhat? And the, the conclusion they come to, you know, in order to do more with less, we have to be able to attrite the American battle line before we get into this daylight engagement. And so in order to do that, we are going to hone our proficiency at night combat to start beating up that formation before we get to that uh, that daylight engagement. And what ends up happening then throughout the course of the 1920s and 30s is you see this more and more elaborate doctrine being built up on the part of the Japanese, where they now envision that this decisive battle, Kante Kessen, is going to telescope from being, you know, a four or five hour action into being this 24 hour extravaganza, wherein we're going to sight the American battle fleet sometime the previous day. We will marshal all of our uh, warships into their night formations. We're going to beat up on the Americans all night long. And then by the morning, that shattered, decimated force will be taken on by the Japanese battle line and annihilated. So, and there's a lot of components that come along to that, but but that is the basic genesis. We've got to figure out how to defeat the American battle line using smaller combatants to whittle them down to size. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the flip side on that is, you know, the U.S. Navy is looking back at the same conflict, World War One, and they're seeing the same lessons emerging that the Japanese have seen. So. What what do they make of night fighting during the interwar period, given that they're coming from a position, theoretically, of either strength if they're fighting the Japanese or if they somehow fight the Royal Navy, they're at least on a par? There's uh, it, it's, it's valuable, I think, to start even before the interwar period, because one <laughs> of the things that I think sometimes gets neglected, given what we can see in the results of the Second World War, particularly the early battles, is, uh, you know, there's this, an assumption that the United States Navy went into it without thorough preparation for, for night combat. And I think that's that's unfortunate. And I'll say more about that in a minute. 
But if we look at the pre-World War I era where the United States is beginning to explore you know, it, it, how best to use these new ship types, these destroyers, which have torpedoes but are very small uh, and very vulnerable, well, obviously, an effective way to bring them into range of their lethal weapons is at night and, and to approach in a stealthy way. And the uh, Atlantic Fleet torpedo flotilla works out tactics and techniques for for doing this and they get pretty skilled at it under the leadership of William S Sims um, you know before he went on to lead US forces in European waters in World War 1 and so the United States destroyer commanders have this at that time anyway sort of this aggressive ethos which in some ways parallels some of the things that the that the Japanese were trying to do right get close uh remain hidden focus on the use of torpedoes uh, and and emphasize uh, stealth. And there's an interesting piece. So uh, Holloway Frost was one of these destroyer commanders, and he wrote an analysis of the Battle of Jutland during the interwar period. And in his section uh, uh, covering the encounter of British destroyers with German battleships uh, at night, uh, he says, well, you know, had those been American destroyers, the results would have been very different. They probably, I don't remember exactly what he says, but essentially he says, you know, they probably all would have been sunk, but they would have attacked <laughs> you know, tenaciously, <laughs> how, which which gives you a sense of how some of the uh, American destroyer commanders were, were, were thinking about their art. Now, getting into the interwar period, as John mentioned, right, there's the treaty regime. Uh, this dictates the relative size of the battle lines, uh, constrains them, and uh, the U.S. Navy is looking at the Pacific in sort of a mirror image way to to the Japanese. Uh, but they're thinking about the distance that they'll have to steam, right? They assume, well, we have to travel across the Pacific. And yes, uh, we have this five to three ratio, but, but we need it because for every thousand miles we steam, the fleet's effectiveness is going to lose about 10%. So they're hoping to get to the Western Pacific with a instead of you know a five to three or a, a 10 to six ratio something that is like seven to six you know right. because there will be losses to you know engineering casualties and and uh, potentially also you know damage the uh, attrition that john was citing across the way so one of the things that they begin to focus on the u.s navy is well we're going to have to be able to protect the battle fleet and the fleet train at night because there are going to be destroyers or other light forces that will try to attack at night and to try to whittle down its strength. So through the, the fleet problems, the 1920s, 1930s, you see this increasing sophistication of not just night combat tactics for attacking a screen formation, but also defending it because you know they know or they expect this is what the Japanese will try to do. So we have to be able to counter it. And we should be able to use our destroyers similarly if we have the opportunity. And what happens through the course of that, in large part because the screening techniques become more sophisticated, it becomes harder to penetrate a formation. Uh, the screens themselves become uh, tighter, they become more sophisticated. So the destroyers begin to work out, well, we have to get to the center of the formation. We can't just, you know, we're not as small as we used to be. Destroyers are getting larger, they're getting more capable. Uh, so we need to be able to enter the enemy formation uh, and usually when we try to do this, we get sighted. So the only way to get through is to punch through. We can do that with our guns. Or we can also partner with the heavy cruisers that are being built under the limitations of the Washington Treaty. So 10,000 tons, eight inch guns, maybe they lead the attacking formation and they create a hole in the enemy's screen allowing the de destroyers to pass through. And by the mid 1930s, there are a number of formations that have been designed with this in mind, right? So uh, the heavy cruisers lead in column and they either break, uh, they sort of split and divide to sail around the enemy formation or they continue on through. Either way, the hole that they punch, the destroyers are intended to go through there and use their torpedoes once they get to the center of the formation and attack. Uh, so these are two night search and attack formations they're called uh but what you see is the shift the shift uh u.s destroyer commanders emphasize their start to emphasize their guns first you know we will use our guns initially because that way we can seize an initial advantage of the outset of an action 
rather than uh, remaining stealthy and firing torpedoes. And that is part of the mindset that is in place by the time World War II starts. And it looks like John John was leaning forward, so I feel like he wants to yeah, say Yeah, no, I was just going to say that there's some real parallels there between what you see happening on the American side and also on the Japanese side. The Japanese, too, recognize that enemy screens are going to be extremely difficult to get through and begin tasking some of their eight inch gun cruisers uh, with exactly the same role that we've got to be able to, you know, smash a hole in the enemy screen such that then we can introduce our, our destroyer squadrons to then unleash these mass torpedo attacks against the enemy. And in fact, the Japanese take it one step further in that they've recently refitted the Congo class um, battle cruisers from battleship division three and begin realizing, one, these ships are no longer fit to stand the line of battle against the Americans. They just don't have the deck protection to make that work. Um, but they could be incredibly useful in night combat because they're big, fast, they've got good command and control facilities, and their gunpower is you know, extremely powerful compared to the enemy cruisers that they may end up running into. And so... By the time you get into the 1930s, uh, particularly with the introduction to the long lance torpedo, which we can you know, talk about uh, later on, what you see is Japanese formations that are anticipating using fast battleships and heavy cruisers to beat their way through the American screen and then introduce two, three, four squadrons of destroyers that are going to launch, you know, 100 or 200 long lances at, at the American battle line. So I'm, I'm intrigued that they're, you know, both sides are seeing that, you know, the screen and getting through that screen is vitally important. And yeah, something yeah, I, I picked, up, picked up looking through uh, the fleet problems was, and the accompanying design issues around it was the, as you said, Trent, the report for about Jutland. Um, there's an argument going on in the early to mid 1930s about where they're going to put the torpedo launchers on newly built U.S. destroyers. And some people are pointing out, well, it would be much more efficient if we have them all on the center line, because then we can fire them either side and we don't we have a big broadside without having to, you know, maneuver around with wing launchers like on the Wixes and the Clemsons. And other people are kind of saying, oh, yes, but if we have sets of wing launchers, we can have more launchers, which means we can put them on gyro steering and they can all go forward in one big wave. And a lot of destroyer commanders are going, the last thing I'm ever doing in my ship is setting a bunch of torpedoes on gyro and hoping for the best. Because <laughs> um, that does, there's a spectacularly long list of ships that where that doesn't work out very well for them. Um and one of the major arguments that's put forward is citing this report on Jutland, where um, uh, the the person who wrote it said that at Jutland there were a number of British destroyers that did have centre line mounts, and they fired all their torpedoes off at the first good opportunity they thought they'd come across, and then when it came to later actions, especially during the night, they actually found themselves with better opportunities, and had no torpedoes with which to exploit those. And then, and then he writes, well, you know, if, in the 1930s, he's now saying, well, if we have wing launchers, then if we go in for an attack and we're coming in at an angle, yeah, we'll fire one set and that might work. But then if the better opportunity comes up, we'll be forced, we'll have, we, we, we have, have this other set, which we can wheel around and use that as well. Whereas if we put them all on the center line, we might end up like the, the Royal Navy at Jutland and be going, well, this is an even better opportunity, but all our torpedoes went over the side you know, 10 minutes ago. Um, so it, it seems to be definitely dominating their thinking how they're going to be using using this. Yeah. 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 The Japanese, for their part, put a, put a lot. I'm sorry, Trent. Um, put a lot of thought into torpedo reloads. You know, once they had developed Long Lance, which is a, this enormous three-ton monster, you know, how do I then get uh, reloads into my torpedo tubes on a timely basis? Um, and so they, they built equipment making it such that you could reload one of those uh, torpedo tubes in between three to five minutes. Now, you know, whether or not that was actually practical, if you're in the middle of a battle and you're, you know, you're maneuvering at high speed, the ship is healing, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the Japanese certainly recognize that problem that, OK, I am going to be using centerline mounts for my destroyers. And yes, I may come into better opportunities down the road. I want the ability to fire multiple salvos. How do I make that happen? And, and they had the gear, the tackle to, to make that sort of stuff 
happen. What I think is very interesting about this is is how much of an anchor the large naval battle becomes, right? So, Alex, you're talking about the mm. the uh, uh, sort of looking at Jutland. Oh, there will mm. be multiple opportunities. Like over the course of many hours, we might have mm. an opportunity to fire, you know, uh, a set of torpedoes, and then uh, we could fire other torpedoes later. And you you see this seeping into the thinking of U.S. Dis destroyer commanders because one of the things that it, it is often emphasized to them is, well, save your torpedoes for the really serious targets. You might fire at a cruiser if you have the opportunity, but you want to be firing at battleships, carriers, those kinds of things. Don't fire your torpedoes at enemy destroyers. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to be a waste, right? Because there's mm -hmm. this, this attitude that there will be a large battle. Uh, it might go on for hours and, and you need to make, you know, the weapons that you have count. And, and it's so different from the fighting that ultimately ensues where right. it's extremely lethal it's over very quickly and if you know oftentimes if you're a u.s destroyer if you don't unleash your torpedoes at the first moment you have you will go down with them on the ship because that's how fast the the mm -hmm. these these battles tend to tend to emerge um john i i don't i can think of it i can think of one instance where the japanese managed to reload torpedoes not in the year we're covering <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> no that, that's that's a, well uh, no i think uh Battle of uh, Java Sea. There, there are yeah. probably instances there, but no. Mm. To your point, you're you're quite right. And and one of the things that made the Japanese so formidable during 1942 is that their destroyers always had their torpedoes in the water, like right now. You yep. know, <laughs> find the target. They had extremely good uh, torpedo fire control equipment that could do things like blind fire solutions and and stuff like that. Uh, in in some ways. Their torpedo uh, directors were as or more sophisticated than their gunfire directors. And so what you see happening in a number of these battles is as soon as the Japanese see a target, it's just like, plop, you know, mm -hmm. in go the long lances and away they go. And now we're just going to bide our time. You know, we know what the run time to the target should be. I'm going to wait for my five minutes. And now when I see the, the torpedoes start to hit, now I open up with my gunfire to smother that target. Mm -hmm do my business and then run for the exits. And that happens over and over again. Yeah. yeah. We've talked about parallels, but that is the, and there are like use of heavy ships to try to penetrate enemy screens, assumptions that the battle will be large. Uh, but that is the key. I think the key differentiator is, you know, the Japanese have invested all this uh, work into making, you know, a, an extremely technologically sophisticated weapon, the, this long lance torpedo, right, which has amazing range, right? So you could argue they don't even really need to penetrate the screen because it's got right. such range. They could just sort of browning shots into an enemy formation if they wanted to. Uh, and where So, you know, you could fire that from, uh, well, you certainly could fire it at ranges beyond 10,000 yards. Yeah. And I, yeah. Whereas, you know, the U.S. destroyer uh, destroyers have to close within about 5,000. Uh, so there's, it's just a it's really, really significant difference in terms of uh, range, speed, lethality, just about everything that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the effectiveness of a weapon system. Yeah. As, as I was saying in the book, you know, the, one of the, the problems that the Japanese have, again, if you're if you're betting on night combat and you've come down on the side of emphasizing your torpedoes, then what you want to see is uh, increases across all three of the dimensions that Trent just mentioned, <laughs> range, speed, and lethality of that weapon. And at its heart, that all comes down to improving the power plant of the torpedo itself. I've got to get more kinetic energy out of this thing to propel this thing through the water. Um, and so what ends up happening during the 1930s uh, is that they make a concerted effort to figure out how to use pure oxygen uh, for the torpedo itself. And that involves some really difficult technical challenges because pure oxygen is nasty to work with. Uh, if there are any sort of grease or solvent in the fuel lines within the torpedo, kaboom. Uh, similarly, any slight machining imperfections in some of those oxygen feed lines. If there's just a little burr of metal sticking up, if you expose that then to a very high uh, speed, high pressure uh, liquid uh, or gas, you know, it has a tendency to heat up. And if it heats up, 
boom. So they really had to, to work very, very diligently to, to master all of these technical problems to come out with this weapon. But the end result is that the, the Type 93 Long Lance is truly one of the uh, premier secret weapons during World War II. The Americans have no idea that the Japanese have a torpedo that has these performance characteristics. And in fact, there's sort of an ongoing, um, I, I don't want to say debate, but it's kind of an exploratory mission that, you know, Trent, myself, uh, some mutual friends, Randy Stone, and others were, were still trying to figure out when did the Americans actually get an idea of the performance characteristics of this particular weapon. We didn't capture one until 1943. Uh, there's a mention of it in an American action report that actually Trent turned me on to uh, in August of 43 that, you know, starts alluding to, yeah, gee, you know, <laughs> This fish is really big, you know, with a 24 inch torpedo. It's 24 feet long. I wonder how far this thing can go. But we've even seen um, American, you know, know your enemy sort of plant pamphlets that have uh, information on the Type 93 from 1945, and it's still not accurate at that point. So, yeah, the, the Americans never understood really what they were up against in, in the form of that particular fish. So we're kind of working. We've working our way into the into the war now. Um, so obviously, for the U.S. and the Japanese, the real fighting starts in early '42 after Pearl Harbor at the end of '41. Um, but both sides are watching their respective allies go hammer and tongs at each other for two and a half years or so prior to that in the European theater. And there's a fair number of night actions during that period. Matapan obviously is the the bit one of the bigger ones. Do either the Japanese or the Americans make any particular changes or improvements to their doctrine in light of reports that they're getting out of Europe? Or do they just kind of look over there and go, yeah, we're pretty sure we could do better than that? <laughs> I did not run across any evidence uh, on the Japanese side that they had taken any of those lessons to heart. Um, yeah, I, I, my sense is that they were extremely confident of their own capabilities and didn't necessarily think that they had a lot to learn uh, from the combatants over in in Europe. What about I, you, Trent? I think from the U.S. side, the the uh, the surface actions that can be seen reinforce the the existing beliefs. Like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, we we understand those things. What the U.S. Navy was a lot more concerned with, and where that learning energy went, was, oh gee, you know, uh, air power is more significant than we anticipated. There's a need for a lot more light anti-aircraft weaponry than we had planned. And so you can see, you know, uh, based on experience in the European war starting in 1939 up through 1941, an investment in uh, more more weaponry, anti-aircraft weaponry on, on US ships, uh, splinter shields, other things. So learning is going on, but uh, to my knowledge, it's primarily focused in on that, like what airplanes could potentially do to surface ships, how much faster they move the airplanes uh, than, than anticipated. And so well, that is is where that energy focuses. As far as the, mm -hmm. the the surface combat, I haven't seen anything that suggests, oh, you know, here's a major learning point that got mm -hmm. fed into doctrine. Everything seems to naturally flow from the work of the 20s mm -hmm. and, 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 and 30s. Yeah. Fair enough. So um, I guess that brings us to 1942 itself. Um, so where do we sit starting 1942? What specific theater night fighting like in terms of the capabilities of both sides, particularly with the ships? I mean, we know I know we've mentioned the long lance itself, um, but what about you know other things like uh, radar, night vision equipment, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Are there any notable strengths or weaknesses on either side that sort of would give them a leg up? <laughs> Yeah, well, on the Japanese side, they've invested very heavily during this whole period in a whole range of different technologies uh, to fight in this particular environment. So uh, optics, as you mentioned, yes, they have invested very heavily um, in good nighttime vision, uh, particularly spotting glasses. So what ends up happening is Nikon comes out with a whole array of very large aperture sets of binoculars. 
uh, to gather as much light uh, as possible and end up coupling that with extremely well-trained lookouts. These are specially hand-picked individuals who have demonstrated that they have good night vision. They are intensely trained using this equipment. And the results are that in many cases, Japanese lookouts can detect the enemy before uh, some of the early and even mid-war radar sets of, are capable of detecting them in return. So you've got optics. Uh, they've invested in flashless powder for their medium and smaller caliber guns so that you can't get a bead on where they're firing at you from. Uh, they have invested in very good searchlights and in some cases also are mating those searchlights with searchlight control directors so that I've got an initial bead. I can see where that target is, but before my guns are going to open up, I'm going to flip on my two searchlights with their cross beams at 10,000 yards. I'm going to smother that target with gunfire. As soon as it is on fire, I'm going to flip my searchlights off and disappear back into the darkness again. So that's sophisticated stuff. Uh, they have a lot of uh, star shells that they can also use for illumination. Um, so, yeah, they, they've, they've got a whole, a whole series of, of technological things in their back pocket that allow them to operate in this environment very, very comfortably. Yeah, one of the things that I think is is uh, interesting if you read the, the chapters of the book in sequence is how much more sophisticated in terms of some of the things that John was just mentioning, the World War II night combat is compared and contrasted to, to World War One. You know, the navies are not sitting idle, not just, you know, the Japanese, but, uh, you know, the, the British Royal Navy, uh, the U.S. Navy, et cetera. They're all thinking about this challenge and and how to how to master it and how to get better at it. Uh, you mentioned radar. Yes. So the U.S. Navy has radar now and is starting to equip you know, by the time early 1942 comes along. Uh, ships with it, it, it comes in two basic forms. There are search radars and then there are fire control radars. The fire control radars, uh, I believe, uh, in these early battles are much more uh, successful and much more valuable, in large part because they graft onto an existing fire control system in a relatively straightforward way. Right? The fire control system needs a range. It, it, you need to understand the distance to the target. And a lot of the times in night battle practices going into World War II, U.S. Navy ships would would use their guns as an initial range finder, right? So you'd estimate that evening, how far can we legitimately see? Okay, we can see about 5,000 yards. So as soon as we see a target, well, shoot at 5,000 yards and see where it lands mm -hmm. and then either bring the shells down or up to try to walk them across the target. The gun as a range finder. Uh, was considered a, a, a legitimate means of, of bringing weaponry onto onto the target. But radar um, makes it so that you don't have to do that. You, you can get that initial range, you can plot it into the fire control system, and then boom, you just fire that range. Uh, and those early uh, fire control radars, the Mark III and the Mark IV, or the FC and the FD is sometimes that they're known, uh, those were pretty accurate with a good operator. The search radars present a different problem because not only uh, do you have to understand you know, where the target is, the range to it, um, as well as the bearing, but you've, you've got to be able to, to plot it and track it over time to make sense of it. And, and this is where the early radars, which had an A-scope display, which is basically an oscilloscope range across the horizontal axis, strength of pip along the strength of return is the pip in the vertical axis. Very difficult to translate that from uh, that two-dimensional screen into uh, sort of a three-dimensional understanding of the world. It, it's not until the PPI display comes along, the, the plan position indicator, which gives you the top-down view, which is what we all think of when we think of a radar, right? Sort right. Of a pulling arc and then a blip. That was That came along later. And so very few U.S. ships have the SG radar, which is the first uh, to have that capability. Uh, by the time of the fighting uh, in late 19, 1942 off Guadalcanal. So using search radar is challenging and problematic. It becomes this, this intellectual cognitive um, burden that has to get overcome. And I think that's one of the reasons why there are reports of you know confusion. I mean, the battles are confusing. They move quickly. Right. Lights go on, lights go off, ships catch on fire. It's very difficult to make sense of it all. 
But some of us, we read, oh, radar. I know what radar is. Radar allows you to see in the dark. Radar gives you this bird's eye view. Well, a lot of those early radars didn't. Uh, and and so it's not just the radar and its technology. It's it's a cognitive system that brings in the operator, that brings in the ship's captain, and all of that has to work together in order for it to to be really effective. Uh, and that is where, although the U.S. Navy is like, hey, we got radar, it can allow us to see it in the dark. You know, night fighting is going to be transformed. Well, yes, but. <laughs> Just having the technology, just having the ability doesn't necessarily translate into cohesive formations that can fight effectively at night. And so you see the U.S. Navy, I think, sort of in this transitional phase between understanding the potential that radar might create and actually capitalizing on it in these battles of 1942. Uh, one other thing that I'd stress is just returning to the gunnery, the ranges at which these ships can see each other uh, and the accuracy of their weaponry particularly guns uh, in 1942 is, is such that it's just the battles move really fast. Uh, you can hit very, very quickly. And then when hit, uh, a lot of these hits are, are, are lethal very quickly. Uh, and so the, the, the battles are extremely fast paced. That's just the nature of these 1942 fights um, in a way that I think some of the earlier technologies wouldn't, wouldn't support because fire control systems weren't as effective uh, a lot of the uh, guns, you know, unlike cruisers of the World War One period, they're individually worked. Uh, but by World War Two, you've got centralized fire control systems. You've got, you know, turreted main batteries, and it just it's very yeah. Very quick. yeah. I, I, I to that end, you know, I was just working on my 1942 manuscript, and being a spreadsheet junkie as I am, I was kind of grinding some numbers, and I was looking at the. The Battle of Friday the 13th, which we'll probably get into, um, you've got Admiral Callahan's Task Force 67 that's going up against Admiral Abe's bombardment force. And, of course, the Americans are completely outclassed in terms of armor penetration. But if you look at the throw weight of Callahan's formation versus Abe's, and then I, I extrapolated it further, and I was like, I wonder how this compares to Montgomery's artillery park for 8th army which was 908 <laughs> barrels okay <laughs> and i ran the numbers callahan has almost a third more throw weight than either abe or montgomery light cruiser helena with her six inch battery is roughly equivalent to a little less than four british infantry divisions in terms of throw weight and that gets to Trent's point that, yeah, you've got centralized fire control, but, but particularly with respect to the weapons mounts themselves, these are power hoists and power ramming. And there's a hell of a lot of metal going out the muzzles in a very short amount of time. So that, again, contributes to the lethality of these engagements, that they're fought at such close ranges with such high rates of fire. That, yeah, if you can take a target under fire in that engagement window, even if it's only a few minutes, you're just going to smash that thing to pieces. And that is a thing that you see occurring in a number of these battles, um, sometimes to the cost of the Americans that they'll overfocus on a, on a single target, like at the Battle of Tassiparanga, the destroyer Takanami uh, is the the. <laughs> the, the the sucker that unfortunately the entire American cruiser force unloads on and you know she's just blown to pieces you know reduced to flaming wreckage in a very short amount of time unfortunately you know in the darkness her <laughs> companions are lining up their long lance shots but anyway I just I just wanted to, to pipe in and say to Trent's point that that's absolutely right that these these engagements are incredibly short incredibly violent and very, very destructive to the to the ships and the men in the ships. Yeah, and I think there's a technical point to to raise there as well, which it well two, one of which when I was looking into the developmental history of the five inch thirty eight um, in the middle of the interwar period, uh, in the early part of its development, there was actually a little bit of pushback against it because they were considering arming destroyers with a five inch twenty five, the anti aircraft gun. I think oh, well, we use that as a dual purpose weapon instead. And one of the arguments that was initially advanced at the late 1920s was, you know, our fire, yes, it's a very much shorter range weapon than the 5-inch 51, which was the previous gun, but our fire control systems are only adequate out, out to a certain range. So the fact that the 25 is a much shorter 
shorter range weapon doesn't actually matter because we can't engage a uh, long enough distance to make take advantage of the the longer barrel of the five inch 51 um and thus the higher rate of fire would be preferable and then there's advances in fire control technology which means that by the early 1930s you can now actually with the destroyers engage further out which then makes having a longer barrel and hence the five inch 38 development much more viable and then when you're talking about the you know the clock we're still fighting at very close ranges um, when it comes to what you, some people call the gun shadow, you know, at long if you're firing at twenty thousand yards, you've got to wait twenty thirty seconds for that shell to land and go. Oh, okay, we were over or under. If you're fighting at five thousand yards, almost by the time you've recovered from the gun blast, you're like, oh, okay, we now have a new data point. Adjust the guns, and you can actually afford. And it sounds a little bit harsh, but you can afford to be less accurate because at you know twenty twenty five thousand yards, it's in a big ballistic arc. You pretty much have to hit dead on or near enough. If you're firing at five, six, seven thousand yards, you're firing almost flat. As long as you're not short, a shell might land at five thousand yards, or six, or seven, or eight thousand yards. But the in, the angle difference is so little that actually in battle that translates to you hit them at the waterline, halfway up, or on the superstructure, all of right. which are good. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, and then you take you combine that with something like Helena's ability to just chuck shells down range. It's like, well, we're hitting something. Keep hitting. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. No. In, in these in these regimes, the five inch thirty eight is a is a terrifying weapon just because of the rate of fire of that thing. It's yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be going up against something like an Atlanta class cruiser. That's you know, there's mm -hmm. sixteen five inch barrels that are blazing away at you. Mm -hmm. And it's got a substantially uh, higher rate of fire than the than the Japanese um, five inch mount, which is a great gun. Don't get me wrong. You know, from a ballistic standpoint, it's superior to the five inch thirty eight, and it's optimized for uh, for surface combat. But it's a terrible anti aircraft weapon, and it doesn't have the rate of fire in these nighttime engagements to let it stand up against the five inch thirty eight. Then again. The Japanese don't want to have to resort to gunfire. We're going to kill you with our torpedoes, and then we're going to run away. So, <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. I suppose mm -hmm. we, we've talked a lot about Guadalcanal um, and the campaign, which we will be coming to um, in a bit. But obviously there's a, there's a fair bit of Japanese versus U.S. Navy action prior to Guadalcanal. Um do either side try and force any major night actions before the Guadalcanal campaign? And if so, what happened to them? Right. Well, there, I think there's three that you can talk about. The first being uh, the Battle of Java Sea, which is mostly known as a nighttime engagement. But intriguingly, when Admiral Takagi goes into that fight, um, he is willing to spar during the daylight hours and see what's going to happen using long range gunfire from his pair of heavy cruisers uh, to go after the, the ABDA force under Dorman. But from their very beginning, he's thinking to himself, okay, but if the action ends up going into the evening, that's where I'm going to be able to really land a telling blow and destroy the enemy force at a stroke. That's the phrase he uses in his after action report. And that's exactly what ends up happening uh, in the event. You know, it's too long to, to talk about the, the tit for tat, but the, the culminating event in that battle is after dark, um, when Dorman's force makes one last desperate lunge for the, for the Japanese invasion convoy. Takagi brings his pair of heavy cruisers down onto a reciprocal course is finally able to get a good shot lined up and fires long lances essentially over his shoulder at the advancing uh, Abda force and ends up sinking uh, both De Reuter and, and Java in just a you know one-two punch that takes them both out, and that's the end of the battle. So you, you can look at that example. Um, the battle uh, off Balikpapan, though that is an allied effort an american uh, destroyer force of six four stackers goes up against a japanese invasion convoy and are really for what they were they were pretty pretty successful they were almost unlucky in that they only sank three transports during that engagement and probably you know had had they had better luck or 
a little more experience perhaps may have sunk even more uh, and, and could potentially have wrecked that particular invasion force. So that was uh, an example where the, you know, the Americans were very aggressively trying to get into a night combat uh, regime. And then the final one is uh, the Battle of Badong Strait near the island of Bali, uh, where, again, there's a Japanese invasion force that's coming down this very narrow strait and ends up in this confused hours long action between mostly Japanese destroyers and allied destroyers and the allies come off worse in that particular environment. Lose, lose a Dutch destroyer, mm -hmm. but it's it's somewhat more inconclusive than than either of the other two actions had been. Trent, anything you want to toss in there? I would I would just add a point or maybe a couple points about Balak Papan uh, because yeah, that is you know old U.S. destroyers, four stackers, uh, and they you know they don't have five inch thirty eights, they don't have the modern fire control, so they have. I know, adopted an approach which harkens back to earlier U.S. ideas about how to fight at night with destroyers, which is we're going to use our torpedoes and try to be more stealthy. And, you know, if opportunities present themselves after the torpedoes have hit, we'll open fire with guns. And, you know, so we'll, we'll mix it up with this with this uh, invasion force, this invasion convoy. Uh, and they do fairly well. I think you're right. I, I, I wonder how much of the, the limits of the destruction that they wreak is due to the, the limitations of U.S. torpedoes, but I don't know which torpedoes they had. Um, they were so, using Mark 8 uh, yeah. primarily, which is, um, you know, the good point on that fish is it doesn't have the exploder problems that Mark <laughs> 14 has. The bad point of that fish is it's slow short range and a, and a teeny little warhead comparatively speaking so yeah i wonder about that i mean obviously it doesn't have the magnetic exploder problems it's not designed to you know really go under the target but it's got a detonator that is still 90 degrees to the path of the torpedo so right does it suffer from some of the same detonator weaknesses that the mark 14 does i don't know uh, don't but know. it's worth thinking about uh, yeah the, and the other one that I would mention is it, it, Night Battle doesn't happen, uh, but there was consideration uh, of one at, at, at Coral Sea. Uh, so okay. Admiral Fletcher is thinking about, you know, should I send out my uh, destroyers and cruisers and, and formulate a night search and attack? He decides against it. He doesn't think it is the prudent decision, given, you know, the relative positions of the forces, his lack of knowledge about where the Japanese actually are. Uh, and the danger of leaving the carriers exposed or that detached formation exposed to carrier attack the next day. Uh, but, uh, you know, his superior, a couple rungs up the chain, uh, Admiral Ernest King, the commander in chief of the, of the U.S. Navy, you know, questions that decision. Like, yes. hey, were you in a position to launch, you know, the night search and attack? We trained for this for decades. King used to be a destroyer captain. He knows about this. Uh, and as King is often want to do, because he's done virtually everything that, uh, you know, the U.S. Navy officers in terms of command positions, he, he will, you know, look over your shoulder and assess whether or not you've done what he would have done. And I think in that instance, he he did not agree uh, fully with Fletcher's decision. I think later on he was convinced of the wisdom of it. Uh, yeah. But initially there was some like, why, why didn't you do this? This was an opportunity. You could have you could have um, destroyed more Japanese forces if you had. Uh, and so I think that's interesting to suggest some of the mentality here, because a lot of times, based on what happened at Guadalcanal, there's a sense that the United States Navy wasn't looking for or wasn't prepared for night combat. But, you know, but here you have its highest ranking officer saying, hey, why why didn't you engage? Why didn't you seek a night action? Yeah, I guess the other sort of abortive night action actually is at Midway, where mm -hmm. Spruan says to make a decision as to whether or not he's going to, you know, move his carrier forces uh off in the more uh what defensive stance i guess i would say move them to the east or do i want to move them to the west to be in a position the following morning to follow up on my victory and and hit the japanese again and he's definitely alert to the to the fact that the japanese might well be gunning for him this evening and reasons that you know, there's nothing I can do with my carriers at night that warrants the risk to that battle force. I want to make sure that this battle stays won. And so he opts for the more uh, prudent course of action and, and bears off to the east. And it's a good thing, too, because, yeah, the Japanese were out looking for him that evening. 
Uh, and had they, you know, brought him under his guns, it could have been a disaster for us. So, yeah. and that now brings us to Guadalcanal. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.